The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Patreon bonus content, Robert Devereux, 3rd Earl of Essex. Welcome to this bonus episode of Pax Britannica. In this special, Patreon-exclusive content, we're going to look at the life, trials, and tribulations of Robert Devereux, 3rd Earl of Essex. Robert Devereux, future 3rd Earl of Essex, was born in 1591, the firstborn child of Robert Devereux, current 2nd Earl of Essex. His home life was unorthodox. Both his father and his mother, Lettice Knollis, the once close favourite of Queen Elizabeth, spent most of their time separate, with both of them having lovers. His father was usually away on campaign, either with success against the Spanish, or otherwise against the Irish. Whatever stability young Bob enjoyed, it was upended in 1601. After his father was executed for a little bit of light treason, his titles were revoked. Soon afterwards, his mother married her lover, Richard Burke, 4th Earl of Clanricard, and went to his estates in the west of Ireland. Robert was now without parents, without his titles, and relatively penniless. Then, to just really ensure he had a traumatic and dysfunctional childhood, he was shipped off to Eton. Things did improve for young Bob when Elizabeth died, and James came to the English and Irish thrones. James had fond memories of the elder Robert Devereux, who had supported his claim to be Elizabeth's heir, and so when the new king entered London, it was young Bob who bore his sword. At James's coronation in July, young Bob was restored to his father's titles. He was now Baron Bouchier, Viscount Hereford, and the third Earl of Essex. He was made a page to the young Prince Henry, and it was clear to all that they should watch Essex's career with great interest. The Howards were one of those watching, and they convinced the king to support a marriage proposal between the 15-year-old Essex and the 15-year-old Francis Howard. The two were married on the 5th of January 1606, and Essex was once again shipped away, this time for a tour of France and the Netherlands, to keep the two newlyweds separate while they reached a more respectable age. When Essex returned to England on the cusp of his 18th birthday, ready to begin married life, it didn't go well. His wife was rumoured, correctly, to be having an affair with Robert Carr, James's current favourite and future Earl of Somerset. To add injury to insult, Essex soon came down with a severe case of smallpox, which left him scarred across his face. Francis was a known beauty, and he was the beast. 
the relationship quickly soured. Essex's relationship with the rest of the court echoed that of his marriage. After Prince Henry called him the son of a traitor, which was technically correct, Essex beat him with a tennis racket. They were playing tennis at the time, it's not like Essex hunted him down after visiting Sports Direct, but attacking the heir of the throne with sporting equipment is something of a faux pas. Essex was soon involved with other brawls, and after yet another attempt to salvage their marriage came to nothing, John Morrill states that Francis tried to poison Essex, Francis became the very public lover of Somerset. In 1613, Somerset and the Howards combined to bring an end to her marriage with Essex. If you remember that far back in the narrative, this was when Frances publicly humiliated her husband by saying that he was impotent. Essex denied this, saying that he, quote, "...hath found an ability of body to know any other woman, and hath sometimes felt the motions and provocations of the flesh." End quote. He wasn't impotent, he just couldn't stand his wife. But the king came down on the side of his favourite's lover, and the judgement found in her favour. Essex was ordered to return Francis's dowry, and then found himself in a duel with his former brother-in-law, Charles Howard. In the second half of James's English reign, Essex found himself in the 1614 Parliament, siding against the court he now so despised. He gave his backing to criticism of the impositions, and to the impeachment of royal ministers. After the Parliament finished, Essex returned to his country estates. He hated court, and court clearly hated him. Notably, when James returned south from his visit to Scotland, he did not visit Essex, despite passing within a mile or two of his home. This would be a snub to anyone, but no more so than to the thin-skinned Essex. Something that must have been a highlight to Essex was the trial of his ex-wife and Somerset, for poisoning Thomas Overbury. He attended their trial in London, where he heard the evidence that Overbury had been targeted, first for imprisonment and then for death, to keep him out of the annulment proceedings. Overbury knew too much about the goings-on between Francis and Somerset, and it would threaten the annulment. The couple were convicted, but only imprisoned. Essex may have taken some solace that it was now a matter of record that his annulment was not reached fairly and that his ex-wife had had to kill to ensure it. Essex also returned to London for the funeral of Queen Anne in 1619, and it was here that he decided to support Frederick V of the Palatine in his war for the Bohemian crown. He raised 300 men and led them to war. In the latter years of James's reign, he was a regular sight in the Netherlands, serving with the Protestant armies and winning the love of the men under his command. With such highlights as beating Prince Henry with a tennis racket to being publicly humiliated by his wife for impotency, by the time of the personal rule, Essex was just done with court life. However, while he found court to be a source of never-ending scorn for him and his family, Essex continued to take some solace in his military career. While slight after slight was poured on him by the court, and then by Charles and his cronies, Essex could take solace from the fact that his name still meant something to the common soldiery. Whenever he raised a new force, they flocked to his banner, and he returned their love with a genuine compassion for their well-being. He may have been the most experienced military commander in the English nobility, but he was no warmonger. His experience of war was mostly stalemates and defeats, with a scattering of victories. In his biography of Essex, John Morrill summarises the Earl's attitude, quote, Essex's military achievements in the 1620s were therefore modest. From them, he learned that outright victory was rarely attainable, and the cost in human life was high. End quote. Essex was appointed to a position of command in the Cardi's expedition, the attempt to outdo his father's successful raid 30 years previously. Of course, that was a poisoned chalice, since that expedition failed spectacularly. Essex wasn't in overall command, and served under the Duke of Buckingham and Sir Edward Cecil, and so he was spared most of the blame for its failure. But Essex was disgusted by both the incompetence of Buckingham and the protections from his failings he received from court. 
Whenever Essex attended Parliament, he became the focus of opposition to Crown policy. He attended almost every day, and while he rarely gave speeches, he was ever present on committees. When Charles pushed for a forced loan in 1627, Essex publicly refused to pay. He supported every attempt by Charles's early parliaments to make the king listen to their grievances, and the king knew it. He spent most of personal rule firmly away from court, managing his estates and his family. He consulted Bishop John Williams about the morality of remarrying while his former wife still lived. When he got a green light from Bishop Williams, he remarried. The marriage began happily, and Essex seemed to have enjoyed a few years of contentment. He began to host events more. He played games and hunted with his extended family. He even began to build a library, and hired a librarian to maintain it. Financially, the deaths of his mother and grandmother, though sad, doubled his income, and when he visited Ireland to inspect his new estates, he was welcomed into Dublin with a grand triumph, proof in Essex's eyes that his name still meant something to the people. But then, because what is Essex's life except a series of humiliating tragedies, it all began to fall apart. His marriage broke down, with his new wife suspected of having an affair with one of the king's courtiers. With his history of courtiers and wives and affairs, it's unsurprising that Essex took the news badly. When his wife became pregnant, Essex publicly declared that if the child was born before a certain date, he would claim it as his own. If it was born after a certain date, then clearly it was the bastard love child of the courtier. Society took bets. When the child was born on the deadline, Essex accepted that the child was his, and apologised to his countess for doubting her. And then, only a month later, the young Viscount Hereford died of the plague. Essex gave up on women, on marriage, and on ever fathering an heir. His new wife was more or less out of his life. When the First Bishop's War broke out, Essex was called upon by Charles to help lead the campaign. He'd kept his head down, possibly by virtue that there wasn't a parliament for him to attend. But he was still no friend to court and his ill favour meant that overall command went to the inexperienced Earl of Arundel. Originally, Essex was going to be his second in command, and so have a much stronger role in leading the campaign. But he was soon demoted to a mere lieutenant general in charge of the cavalry. Smarting at this, Essex nevertheless did his duty, and when the Covenanter leadership wrote to him, wishing that he intervene with the king on their behalf, Essex didn't even open the letters. He loyally sent them on to Charles, who naturally took this as a sign that Essex couldn't be trusted. Why else had the Scottish rebels written to him if not expecting him to help them? As we know, the First Bishop's War was a disaster for Charles, but that didn't stop him showering honours on the men who led it. Except for Essex. No, Essex was conspicuously passed over, and when the Second War broke out, he was replaced entirely by the Earl of Strafford. Another snub, another insult, and Essex was not one to take these lightly. During the short Parliament, Essex continued to attend almost every day. He was one of the peers who had voted against granting supply without the King first considering their grievances. After the short Parliament became the short Parliament, Essex spent the summer in London, for the first time in years, conspiring with John Pym and the other leaders of the opposition. By this point, he had almost certainly started opening the letters the Covenanters were sending him, and sending his own back. When Charles was defeated in the Second Bishop's War, and called a Magnum Concilium, Essex dutifully attended. It won't shock you to learn that he was one of those twelve peers who pressured the king to call another parliament. He also took part in the treaty negotiations. When the Long Parliament finally met, Essex was a figure of key importance. Not only was he a powerful and wealthy peer who held the proxy votes of two, and sometimes three, other lords, but he could count on as many as twelve MPs in the Commons who owed their positions to him. Essex used this influence. He was determined to destroy the instruments of personal rule, and he was a champion of the Triennial Act. But he was not in favour of the root and branch reforms. He feared the consequences of such a radical platform, 
and how it might alter the social and political status quo. So, while Charles disliked him personally, he knew that Essex would be a useful ally to head off these more extreme demands. He had the influence and the inclination to rein in the other opposition leaders. So Charles appointed him, along with six others, to the Privy Council, and Essex worked to ensure that more of his allies would find themselves on the council alongside him. But Charles was stubborn, and he didn't like Essex, so the king delayed granting Essex the positions and the trust that would be required to win over the notoriously thin-skinned earl. Instead of making him an ally and winning him over from the leadership of his enemies, Charles kept him at arm's length. The king took the opposite approach with the now Marquess of Hertford, William Seymour, husband to Essex's sister Frances and one of the earl's closest friends. Hartford only became more trusted by the king. Essex was not done with tragedy. In July 1641, his only brother Walter died of plague. Essex was now resigned to the extinction of his family line, even though there were more Devereaux's knocking about. While a terrible burden for a patriarch in this society, it did have its silver linings. Morrill suggests that perhaps this made him less concerned about the consequences of his actions in the coming years. It was hardly like he had a family to ruin. While Charles was in Scotland, Essex took on the role of Parliament's protector, building up his forces to defend the MPs from assassins. There had been plenty of death threats, after all. With the Irish Rebellion, Parliament began to assert its control over the militias, and Essex was suggested as their commander. So when Charles returned from Scotland, he was furious with Parliament, and he naturally revoked the Earl's commission and disbanded his troops. Morrill has a wonderful turn of phrase. Distrust and distaste reinforced one another. Charles felt betrayed, and therefore would not give Essex the honour and trust he craved. But Essex, feeling keenly and resenting this lack of trust and recognition, constantly rubbed salt into Charles's wounds. They were two thin-skinned men jabbing fingers into one another's flesh. When Charles decided to arrest the five members, Essex was one of those who tipped them off. The division between King and Earl only became more public from this point on. When Charles fled London, he repeatedly summoned Essex to his new court. Essex repeatedly denied him. In April, he was removed from his position as Lord Chamberlain. When Parliament passed the Militia Ordinance, Essex was the first peer to resign his royal commission as a Lord Lieutenant in order to accept the parliamentary one. Essex was named as the General for Parliament's armies. He took on the role zealously. He knew the risks. Even if he didn't die on campaign, defeat would almost certainly mean he followed his father to the headsman. Essex drafted a new bill and dispersed his estates among his remaining family. His servants were richly rewarded for their years of service. Oh, and he ordered his own coffin. His decision to stand against the king for Parliament was confirmed, for Essex personally, when one of the king's peace offers was delivered by the same courtier who had cuckled at him with his second wife. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. Madame Tussaud. 
We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realise the historical significance of the woman behind the name, or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy.